sargasm solution. Sargasm is an issue across the Caribbean and sections of the Western Hemisphere. And today we have two experts from our Caribbean region who will share with us the solution to sargasm. They'll tell us what is sargasm, what is happening in their region, and what are the possible solutions and what have they been doing in their region. So our guest today is Professor Mona Weber. She's a marine biologist, she has 30 years experience in the field. She is a senior chair of the Environmental Management Unit at the University of the West Indies and the director of the Center of Marine Sciences. Dr. Weber, welcome. We are very pleased to have you sharing with the National Environment and Planning Agency this morning. And our second guest who we'll hear from in a little while is an entrepreneur from our sister island over there in Barbados. He is Joshua Fort. He is a chief executive officer of a special company, Red Dot Compost. So we're gonna learn more from our colleagues in research, in entrepreneurship, what is happening in the world of the, in the environmental world, what is sargasm, and why are we experiences, experiencing this phenomena in our Caribbean region. First, I'm gonna go over to our guest from the University of the West Indies, Professor Mona Weber. Welcome, Professor. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and shall I proceed to share my screen? Absolutely, Professor. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I, um, I think you're now seeing my slides. And I'm, I, I was invited to speak about what we've been doing with sargassum at the University of the West Indies, the kind of research that we've been conducting. And I will mention a little bit about what is sargassum, but the primary focus is to talk about the Jamaican experience with, with this um, weed, especially from a research perspective, because we, thanks to NEPA, we started looking at sargassum and formed a research group, and we focused on valorization of the, of the sargassum. So it's a little bit of an update on the research and, and the potential for, for what my colleague will speak about that they have been actualizing in the, in the Eastern Caribbean. So I think most people know sargassum started showing up in Jamaica around 2011, but it was not until about 2014, 15, really 2015 that we, we started to take notice. The quantities at that time were, were, were quite high and the North Coast in particular was affected. This is a picture of Discovery Bay Marine Lab on the North Coast done by Nashika Gaya, a student there at the time. North and South Coast were being affected. And by 2018, we had quantities in Jamaica that were said to be unprecedented. And not only were the quantities huge, the, the inundation at the time was, was continuous. Jamaica and, and, and throughout the Caribbean. Um, we responded, um, NEPA did collections and, and cleanups at various beaches funded by the Tourism Enhancement Fund and in partnership with UDC and others. And they, they Responses had to be measured um, because you don't want to damage the beach. Now in, in 2000, 2021, we're still having huge quantities of sargassum. Um, May of this year was actually said to be 6% more. We, we had 6% more biomass than the equivalent May in 2018. Um, so we, we it's, it's been said all over the Caribbean, and the person who's giving focus to this phenomenon says, think sargassum is here to stay. And, and that's very important to note because we, we, we and our global partners throughout the Caribbean and our global partners 
have had to respond. It, it, this has been called phenomenal. Um, we, we are part of what is now the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. And so we, you cannot ignore what is happening to our beaches and in our waters. And, and I alluded to the fact that NEPA um, contacted our faculty and, and asked us to give attention to this issue. And so we formed a Sargassum Research Group with the mandate to explore the potential and the commercial, potential commercial uses of, of Sargassum. So we started, we, we, we knew very little about the, the, the algal um, biomass. We, we knew very little about the species. We started collecting and, and studying Sargassum. We, we were looking at the spatial differences, whether the Sargassum in Negril was different from that on the North Coast, as opposed to that on the East Coast. We collected in Palisados on the south coast, Fort Rocky, and, and along Helsha. And we literally had to learn quickly. We had to learn, like you, what is sargassum? It's a brown alga. It actually has a range of species and types, but the holopelagic form, the form that floats in the water column that is causing the problem now, really has two species. This alga is normally found in the Sargasso Sea of Bermuda, and it started becoming a problem in the Caribbean in, in, in 2011. And so we learned about the different morphotypes. Sargassum fluitans can have two morphotypes. Sargassum natans can have four. But the ones that are causing the problem or, or, or bringing the resource to our doorstep are Sargassum Natans 1 and 8 and Sargassum Fluitans 3. I, I'll mention Natans and Fluitans again, but we literally had to learn how to distinguish these, um, these algae that superficially look similar because we found that they had different composition, different chemical constituents. So you need to learn what your resource has before you can use it effectively. So we studied the chemical profile of these different species and types. And we found that the nitrates and the phosphates and the iron, they're rich in nutrients. Those, those nutrients are, are very much present. And they also had interesting compounds like alginate and fucoidans, I'll talk about those in a little bit. And the different species and types had different ratios. So based on our preliminary studies, very preliminary, we thought Sargassum natans had the greatest potential for valorization, for using, being able to use this algal biomass. So the literature also taught us that the Eastern Caribbean gave attention to this um, issue long before we did, as they began being inundated, beaches were being covered um, long before we were. And so persons had started exploring use as animal feeds. Um, the, the sargassum actually creates a healthier rumen um, habitat in, in ruminants and so produces, they produce less methane if they're fed quantities of sargassum. Um, cosmetic industry, agriculture, it has nitrates and phosphates. Um, fuel, biofuel could be produced from the sargassum. Food, um, bioplastic could be produced. And of course, the famous sargassum house in Mexico, which is 60% is cheaper. Um, using sargassum made bricks. So these, these, by 2018, these were well-established uses. So my colleagues and I in the, in the research group at the University of the West Indies decided to look at how we could, we, we categorize the potential use of, of sargassum. We, we and, and this was driven primarily by Dr. Howard Reed, 
and, and a colleague, Terry Channon at the University of York. They looked at separating into high volume, so using large quantities of the biomass in relatively low value um, applications. So for, for fertilizer or for biogas generation, and then using high volumes again, number two, um, but medium value. And this is where we looked at extracting complex car carbohydrates and the alginates and so on for use in the food industry. And then thirdly, we looked at low volume, high value. So small quantities of the different species and their potential for producing bioactive compounds um, for medical use. And so currently, we are looking at a little bit at all three of those. We have done some work and are doing work with the Scientific Research Council. They are using sargassum in, in biodigestion and they're using, they, they, they're looking at the biomethane potential currently, but the, the plan is to scale up and potentially use sargassum and pig slurry in home biodigesters. A 50-50 um, ratio is, is being shown by their experiments to be, to be ideal. So we hope to scale up and continue these experiments. We at the university have done some work with crops and we, we've been using tomato and corn, but corn in particular, the, the research done with that showed significantly higher um, biomass produced with the, with the sargassum. And this was in the compost form. And of course, we, we, are, we want to take these experiments further. Marketable yield was not significantly different, but we want to explore that. We have had students from UTEC, Capleton Hall and Stephanie Linton Shields, looked at extracting the, the extracting from the sargassum using water. And a liquid extract was used to, to, to water plants, again, corn and tomato, um, with very, very positive results. So we thought if this is a fertilizer and we produce mangroves for restoration, perhaps we could use sargassum in, in the mangrove nursery. So at Discovery Bay, we tried sargassum in different proportions in the nursery. It was not as successful in the wet nursery, but certainly in the dry nursery, we have seen the potential for sargassum compost as a fertilizer. And when you're trying to do mangrove restorations in places like the, the Palisados, where there isn't a lot of organic matter, it's fairly sandy we see the potential for, for using the sargassum in this regard. But we, we are doing tests right now. We have sent away the mangrove plants, um, the, or, or powders of it, and the, the, the compost that we used, as well as the soil, to test for, for heavy metals and arsenic concentrations. Um, we've done a little bit of high volume, low value use, where we have extracted alginates, and the student tried using sargassum in bioplastics. And that, that is still being worked on. But what I found very interesting, my colleagues at the Natural Products Institute at the UWI have used sargassum extracts on can cancer cells. So they've treated prostate and breast cancer cells. The extract now used um, organic, we used organic solvents, methane and dichloromethane to extract the uh, compounds from the sargassum. And the highest, the highest effect was the extract with sargassum fluitants using, using methanol. So those, those experiments are, need to be expanded, need to be replicated, and they are in the process of getting funding to expand as we, as we seek to, to confirm and to do more in this, in this regard. So we, we, while we think valorization is the answer and, and the balance of valorization, if you can get some high priced compounds and you can also use the, the, the algal biomass in, in, in large quantities, then you can pay for the cleanup and for the collection. 
the, the, there are challenges. We, we worry about the heavy metal, the, the, the natural heavy metals in the sargassum plant, um, or alga, sorry, and it absorbs, it takes up toxins when it's in the environment. It is episodic. We, we're not sure sometimes. Some years it's, it's not there. Sometimes it's not in certain places. And so we've thought of exploring storage. We need to be able to predict when sargassum will come and we need to be able to collect it efficiently. So we, we do not damage our, our beaches. Collection of sea at sea, sorry, is, is recommended. Um, but large scale collection will have to be explored if we're gonna use this in mass. And as you can see, Mexico Barbados, the Dom Rep, they're well ahead of us in this regard. They're collecting huge quantities and commercializing the, the sargassum. We are working in partnership with the University of Southampton and, and Cave Hill is also involved, a Star Trek project. MGI here is trying to predict where Sargassum will beach consistently so we can know which beaches to protect as well as where to focus our collection efforts. Um, and these correspond to areas we've been collecting Sargassum from over the last few years. So potential for valorization, um, you can call it a solution, yes. It's a beautiful coincidence. I'm quoting what a, what a colleague at Cave Hill said. There's a beautiful coincidence that the ocean is providing all this biomass. And it's a shame not to use it. And some of us wish it would go away, but if we can use it, we can fund the cleanups and we can fund persons who have a difficulty with the with with the with it landing on their shores, so we think valorization yes is a significant part of the solution. Thank you for listening, and our partners and funders are shown. Truly, this has been quite a bit of positive information. Quite a few solutions presented to us by you, Professor Mona Weber. And one of those solutions you mentioned was entrepreneurship. And so now I'm going to turn to my or a colleague in Barbados at Red Diamond Compost Limited. Joshua Fort is a CEO of this company. And so he's going to share with us what has what has he been able to accomplish in Barbados as a part of his solution to the sargasm issues that we're having in the Caribbean coastal areas. Over to you, Joshua. Thank you, Ava, and thank you all for having me here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to present to you um, the work that um, we've been doing at Red Diamond. And first off, I'd actually like to share a bit, um, a bit of the Red Diamond story and, and how we even got started in working with Sargassum to begin with. And just making sure you can see my, my um, screen. Yes, we can. We're seeing your screen. Okay, great. So for, for me, um, you know, looking at sargassum uh, was probably from a different perspective as most people when it arrived. And that has to do with simply what the purpose of Red Diamond Compost um, has been since its inception. So we are a biotech social enterprise that focus on creating um, clean and green organic and biologic agrochemicals. So they're made primarily from organic waste materials, um, anything made from plant, and plant or animal sources, essentially. So back in 2012, um, I would have been going through my own health crisis um, and actually dealing with that situation where I was trying to improve my health and, and um, try to learn more, to understand more about nutrition it led me to a place of learning about nutrient dense foods. And from there, I went down the rabbit hole of looking at how our foods were actually grown here in Barbados and across the world, you know, where the majority of our foods are imported. Um, and realizing this similar trend of the use of toxic synthetic chemicals um, in, in agriculture and, you know, in the foods that we consume. 
And at the same time, there were so many different um, articles and, and press releases coming out about the rising cases of NCDs um, in, in Barbados and the Caribbean, and especially amongst our youth. And I even had a, a young lady in my own community, um, a, a young girl, nine, only nine years old, you know, losing her life um, to one of these diseases. So with the experiences that I had gone through and starting to imp actually improve my health, um, focusing more on, on um, plant nutrition. And then these different occurrences that were happening at the same time, um, I, I kind of rose this conviction in me that this is the area that I needed to focus on, um, being able to produce solutions that you know, create that, that abundance of rich, um, nutrient-rich soil and nutrient-rich plants. So thankfully, I would say through my process, I was able to get a mentor early on, a soil scientist from Texas who's been a soil scientist for 25 plus years now. And he really started to guide me and, and, and mentor me along how to go about, say, developing this idea I had for red diamond compost. So it was the, you know, from the early stages, it was a lot of, of research, literally learning um, the, the, the sciences around creating these types of solutions, but also the, the agricultural industry, understanding how our food was produced, the sources of the, the inputs and everything that was used. And it kind of gave us this entire roadmap of um, a blueprint, really, of what the, the, the landscape surrounding our food and the environment and our health really looked like. And we were actually able to see how these things in, interconnected. And for me, it was truly amazing to see the similarities between, you know, studying actual human health and nutrition and looking at the soil. And there were so many similarities um, that you could see there. So how do we then deal with this challenge of um, these toxic synthetic chemicals in our food, in our soils that are damaging our environment, that are negative impacts on pollinating insects that are polluting our same oceans? and could be potentially contributing to the, these blooms of sargassum that we were seeing. Now, when, say, in late 2014 into 2015, here in Barbados, really huge, huge um, mats of sargassum um, started to pile up. At that time is when I decided to shift gears from where I was focusing on initially um, and use the sargassum because the material was in such abundance. And again, it was toward my goal of how do I create the, the, the best um, soil environment for plants to be able to reach their full genetic potential, to be able to have as much nutrient holding capacity and be able to provide that for us to consume. So sargassum, as we all know, um, and as you guys know in Jamaica with it on your shores right now, the stigma that it carries with it, the strong stigma, the, the problems that come with it, um, people see it as a nuisance, a huge headache, um, a health hazard even. Um, some of our communities are even still plagued um, seasonally by the, the sargassum because it's in some areas that are very, very hard to move, especially without um, damaging the beaches. So while everyone was looking at sargassum and it arrived as this huge headache, for me, it was a whole different story. And this, this quote here is kind of the principle that I, I um, was following. So for results to be achieved, resources must be allocated to opportunities rather than problems. So it's essentially looking at this situation that we are seeing on our shores as this huge problem and this huge headache, but rather thinking of it from a solution perspective. What solutions can we, can we come up with to deal with this situation? that could benefit us socially, economically, and otherwise. So this was where I started my research and digging up tons and tons of research papers, anything to do with sargassum seaweed, wherever in the world it was. Um, and you know, that included not only the sargassum fluitans and natans that we have in our region, but all the different other varieties around the world as well. So what similar work was done um, because at this early time, you're talking, you know, 20, 2015, like there really was not much information at all available. So it was going based on, on just what I could find, some of it pretty old research, but also even research on similar seaweeds, to, well, and algae to understand how it actually functioned. 
and what precautions we may need to take in developing a solution from it. So in the images here, you could see the, the issues that we would be familiar with. And this is on our course here in Barbados. Um, we see sea turtles dying. We had the uh, Mahi Mahi dying and being choked up, literally choked up in the sargassum. Um, you know, the, the huge mass of it literally killing um, the coastal marine life. And then you have us starting to go and literally collect the sargassum and starting to concoct our various solutions and, and doing our own um, in-house trials and testing. Now, for me, it was a, a very long haul to get people even interested in looking at sargassum from the solution perspective. And I would go literally on our East Coast early in the morning and see an entire coastline covered um, completely in sargassum and wondering why I was the only person out there looking to do something with this, with this material, you know, because again, for us, plant material is, 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 is gold. And it was through various processes, various trial and error, um, doing our testings and so on, that we came to develop our super seaweed biostimulant from the sargassum seaweed. And here pictured are, are two other um, products that we carry that are not necessarily primarily from sargassum, um, but they're plant-based um, and animal-based solutions as well. But our super seaweed biostimulant, we had given some of it to um, UEK Field Campus here for them to do, conduct some trials. And with us looking to market it specifically as a biostimulant, which is more like a supplement for plants and not necessarily a main fertilizer, what they saw in using it compared to um, a very popular synthetic fertilizer is that with the biostimulant on its own, we had a nearly 40% increase in overall plant production. Um, this was with sweet pepper crops um, compared to the synthetic fertilizer by itself. But even by cutting the synthetic fertilizer by half and adding our super seaweed biostimulant to it, um, it still had even greater results. So again, this goes to looking to reduce the, the use of these different toxic synthetic chemicals that are not, um, are, that don't create a positive environment for the beneficial microbes in the soil, which is what our solutions are, are um, designed to work with. So doing this work with the sargassum um, has been the main focus for Red Diamond over the past few years. And with that, we've been able to um, compete in various competitions and attend various entrepreneurship events across the world from the Young America's Business Trust um, Caribbean Innovation Competition, um, from the Global Entrepreneurship Summit held by the US and the Netherlands back in 2019, um, the, the Climate Launch Plaid, um, Green, green tech competition and, and various others. But the goal for us is the model that we've actually designed kind of using um, piggybacking off of Sargassum and developing um, our broader model and our broader um, goal for bioconversion of these organic materials. We've created a model and a system that we're looking to um, duplicate in, in any given territory where, again, organic resources are available. So anything from a plant material like sargassum or otherwise, um, could be any other invasive plant species, organic waste materials, um, and those derived from, derived from animals as well, like fish, offal, um, and so on. So again, the goal for us, the, and the main driver for us was how do we not have this image being the future of our, of, you know, my own generation and the future generations to come, you know, not having food that is so toxic um, that you need this level of protection to, to consume it, but having an environment that is rich and diverse um, in the foods that we consume. So, you know, for me, it was taking that leap of faith, taking that first step out to actually create something, see if it works, see what happens, see what we can learn from it and continue developing it and developing it from there. And again, I, I know what kind of, you know, has missed some time is the, the actual research and the data that, that Professor Weber would have highlighted. That information is so, so critical and crucial. It's really the foundation of 
um, entrepreneurs like myself being able to develop solutions from sargassum or any other um, types of materials. And it is, you know, in those early years where I really wish, you know, the, the, the structure of, of the institutions, the academic institutions were kind of hyper-focused on this, this, this model of um, conducting research in these areas and, and being able to, you know, create value from them, create the economic value from them that we're kind of seeing now and realizing um, with, with the sargassum. So it, it's something that goes hand in hand where, you know, the, the research um, is foundational to the, the entrepreneurs being able to actually act and execute. But, you know, by no means, you know, for, for us entrepreneurs, by no means um, are we able to kind of wait until all of that information is, is, is collected or all the research is done. But, you know, especially when it comes to sargassum, I say, you know, for persons who are interested in working with it in any sort of agricultural, pharmaceutical, in any type of in-depth in, in type of way, um, there's certain precautions, you know, that, that needs to be taken when dealing with the material, as Dr. Weber said, um, it, 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 you know, it's kind of a sponge in the ocean collecting, soaking up all these different types of materials. Um, so these, these are some of the things that needs to be paid attention to for persons looking to work with the sargassum. Thank you. And thank you, Joshua Fort, over there in Barbados. This morning here at the National Environment and Planning Agency, we have science meets entrepreneurship. And our guest speakers thus far has been Pro Pro Professor Mona Weber. She is a scientist, a marine biologist, and she has been conducting and leading research here in Jamaica on sargassum. We also just heard from our colleague in Barbados, Joshua Ford, CEO of Red Diamond compost in, on our YouTube channel. We have guests who are joining us from West Palm Beach, Puerto Rico, and right here in Portland Cottage, Jamaica. And so we have questions for you, our speakers. First question comes to us from our colleague in Portland Cottage. And Junior Powell wants to know, how can fisher folks work more closely with you in terms of manufacturing products from this natural resource called sargassum? Thank you. Um, I think, it, th and this is something that I was, I was considering and thinking about for a very, very long time, um, where our fisher folk here in Barbados were going through a very rough time, you know, because they, there wasn't any, any fish for them to, to go. They couldn't go and play their trade. And there was only sargassum completely smothering the coastline. And it's getting to that point where, where the, the idea is, okay, how can the fisher folk go from, you know, fishing for fish, but actually start fishing for sargassum? Um, because the collection part of it is, when we're talking about the production, um, the production line, the collection part of it is one of the most tedious processes. And being able to do that efficiently and effectively while maintaining the, the, the integrity of our coastal um, environment is, is extremely important. So we here have been looking at models of um, more manual collection, not necessarily using the heavy machinery um, of, of um, harvesting near shore sargassum, um, using fishing vessels, um, using the fishing boats, using the pontoons um, and nets to actually get this done. For us, um, the extraction process, we create a very concentrated extract. So the value that we are able to get out of, um, say, one, one ton of wet sargassum is quite a lot. So I think this you know, for, for us or for any other entrepreneur looking at this, working out the economics of it is like the hardest part of it because we have to make it worthwhile for the fish folk to go out there and actually harvest it and still for us to be able to um, go through our production process and, and have a, a product that we can take to market at a competitive price. You know, so working out that, that economics of it is, is something that um, is still kind of in the process and we're still like, like, seeing what works best. 
But I think getting to a point where we can have some type of standard, whether it is um, say a facility like my per being able to purchase the sargassum from Fisher Folk at a agreed price or um, having some, some other type of arrangement um, is key, but definitely there's, there's a huge opportunity there. Indeed. So we're seeking out the opportunities as we speak about Sargasm Solution this morning on our NEPA YouTube, NEPA Jamaica YouTube channel. We also have someone who was asking us on our YouTube chat, and this person says, what happens to Sargasm once it's clean from the beaches currently in Jamaica and Barbados? Now you heard about some of the research solutions that's taking place. Perhaps this person joined us a bit late. Let's give a quick recap. Prof, do you wanna share with this person what yes, happens? Yes, yes. Well, well, first off, I think they are referring to the, the large scale collections that may have been done by NEPA, by others. And what is really the easiest thing to do is to remove the sargassum from the beachfront where it's gonna get wet, where it's gonna decay and, and, be, and the hydrogen sulfide is gonna be produced. And I don't know if, if you have seen this dark brown water or a red brown water that is now at Helsha, which is very low in oxygen because the sargassum is decaying in the water. The idea is to get it away from the edge, from the water's edge, and it's piled primarily against the dunes. Because in reasonable quantities, sargassum is very useful for helping to trap sand and helping to build up the dunes. So those large scale, really beach cleanups are we're piling the sargassum against the dunes and, and it will naturally break down and really help to, to replenish the dunes. The other collections, of course, we do, as, as my colleague indicated, we have to do at sea or even in, 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 in the um, foreshore before the material beaches. And, and that we are using for the composting um, and the extracting, as, as was mentioned. So the, 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 the key thing is to collect the material before it piles up on the beach. That is the challenge. All right, so we, though we have solutions, we still have our challenges. And we have a colleague over in Puerto Rico, and he says he's looking forward for Puerto Rico to working closer with other Caribbean partners as we forge forward to create new local economies and healthier oceans related to sargasm. Yes, wonderful. Um, Jeremy Long is saying, thank you, Professor. You understood me. Thank you. He's quite grateful. So this morning, we're discussing Sargasm Solutions here on our YouTube channel. We'd like you to, of course, subscribe. We want you to click. So whenever we have new notifications, we encourage you to join us here on NEPA's National Environment and Planning Agency's new channel. What have we been learning so far? Uh, Prof taught us about the research which has been done, not just in Jamaica, but she also gave us examples, cosmetics, biofuel. And we are learning from our colleague, Joshua Ford at Red Diamond, the compost, he had an issue, he had a problem. And so he wanted a solution. And so he delved into research as well. What is the future? What does the future of sargasm look, look like for our Caribbean countries? How are we going to manage? Um, does anyone care to share with us? Uh, what their, the projections are in terms of managing sargasm? I know to my presenters are smiling. I, I will quickly go first. <laughs> I really like to watch, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm forgetting the name, Joshua. I really liked what Joshua said about the partnership with academia and, and entrepreneurs. The university is, is developing an entrepreneurship center and so on, but while we do that, we really need the, the ideas and the arms and legs of persons like Joshua um, to, to, they have the energy and, and they have the focus 
to use our research, but also to help us focus our research. So we, we go at a problem and we look at everything <laughs> and then we try and, and see what is worth studying. But we could go off on a tangent if we don't have the persons who have the entrepreneurial ideas to say, I would like to use it to do this. How can you, can you focus your study in this particular area? So those students from UTEC, Stephanie and, um, and Cableton, they looked at the adding the, the liquid sargassum and compared it to synthetic fertilizer and they had their control and they actually produced quite good data on the value of, of the thing without using synthetic fertilizers. And that was always their passion. We want to get away from synthetic fertilizers. But who would take that from us? Joshua is running with it. And so it's very critical that the partnership for the future of the, the sargassum solutions, the partnership has to be there between academia and, and, the, end, and, and the entrepreneurs and the end users. Yeah, definitely, definitely, I agree. Um, and and you know, further to that, I see, you know, we see all the different opportunities um, of what can be done with sargassum. It's a very versatile material, a very versatile plant. And I, I mean, it's, it's really we, like I said, when I when I go to the coast and I see all of that sargassum, it's like gold on it, washing up on the beaches, essentially. So it's it's it's, our, it's in our hands for us to do with it. You know, the opportunity is in our hands for us to do something with it and make something with it. And you know, right now with everything, um, all the all of the focus on on combating climate change and sustainability and health, I see us being able to really develop our blue economies in the region um, heavily with sargassum is something that is like, if there's anyone out there that isn't working with sargassum, looking at sargassum, I would say, hey, turn your attention this way because this is, you know, this is a, like our, our different um, black gold for us. The Caribbean's black Gold, wonderful. We have another comment, and this time, well, we have a question. And Donovan he is asking: Are there specialist equipment that can be used to harvest sargassum from the beaches while minimizing damage to the beach environment? So there, there is. So it's kind of a, a yes to it, but it's, it's with conditions, it's tricky. Um, so when we were, we were engaging um, some of the companies that were developing solutions or had other, um, you know, algal so collection so solutions from, from France and so on, who were looking to present it to us. And one thing, like the first thing that we realized is the environmental conditions, the weather conditions are, are drastically different. And those conditions actually determine whether or not the equipment that is being suggested would be actually effective or not, or would it even be safe to use or not. So, and, and this is why I, I would say for us who have already started out in the, in the area, um, things have been moving slowly on that part because other than like the, the um, images that Dr. Weber would have, would have shown um, of our collection vessels at sea, um, there's not been much other, um, you know, innovations or new developments happening in terms of being able to economically, um, you know, harvest the sargassum at sea. It, 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 it is, again, like a, another economics, you know, issue of it when you're looking at investing in this piece of equipment. So like those, those vessels that you would have seen are very, very, very expensive. So for this being such an early, early industry that's now being developed, um, it, is, it is like, for persons like myself, it is hard work trying to um, get governments or investors um, convincing them to see, um, you know, that this is actually a viable investment um, for the next, you know, 10, 20 years, and it's, it's worthwhile. Um, to actually, to actually invest in these different types of equipment, but still identifying the ideal equipment is still a, a very difficult and early process. 
thank you to our guest. We are live on our NEPA's YouTube channel as we share with our guests across the region, Sargasm Solutions. Uh, this morning, we have learned of science, how science has embraced entrepreneurship. And so we have solutions out of Barbados and Jamaica as we explore other alternatives to the use of sargasm. Prof, I was very impressed with your mention of the making of bricks. The use of sargasm in, in construction that hosts you mentioned in Mexico. Is that an option for us in Jamaica? Is that something we can duplicate in Jamaica? I'm, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. It, it's, and again, it would be using large quantities of the sargassum. And collects the wet biomass and, and literally produces the bricks. We, we, need, we need manufacturers to take on this problem. I know we have um, Avian Marson, who I gather is setting up to produce sargassum um, blocks for, like charcoal to use, to use for fuel, but we need other persons to take on the issue um, and, and to, to produce material. This is extremely valuable, as, as Joshua says. It's our, it's our gold, and it's golden brown. It's perfect. So let's, let's think of ways to use it indeed. Wonderful, wonderful. We have Kay Johnson, and she's asking, what would the generic financial and industrial necessity look like for our Caribbean countries to be able to stably keep up with these solutions? What would it take for our Caribbean countries to keep up with the possibility of these solutions? Colleagues, are there any projections? Um, that one, I, 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 I am not 100% um, sure on what it would take. I, I mean, even when we look at our various Caribbean islands and we had at least two Caribbean-wide um, sargassum symposiums already, and, and, you know, really looking at these solutions and what it would take. Uh, but I, I think where, where it begins again is in one, the, the research that academia is doing and the, the focus of actually looking to in, have investment um, take place within the industry, within the sector. There's a lot, I mean, even when we look at the ph pharmaceutical potential of sargassum, there's a lot of value that is within it. Right. So it, it, it's literally taking it seriously, not just looking at a, not just looking at it as a nuisance and looking to seriously invest in the development of it. Because honestly, and I've, I've already seen signs of it. If we don't, someone else will come from somewhere else and take advantage of it if we don't. Wonderful. As we're coming to the close of this our session, which looked at sargasm solutions. Uh, I see more comments are coming in from our YouTube channel. I'm gonna take one final, one final question. Um, Prof, this one is directly for you. Our researcher in Portland by protected area wants to know if you have been coming across other seaweed uh, such as the thalsia, if you have been seeing it building up on our beaches? Have you been coming in, have you been observing um, that? Thalsia? Uh, T-H-E-L-E-S-S-I-A. No, -S 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 oh, he's referring Thalassia. to Thalassia. Ah, yes, they, that, that is seagrass, the broad strap-shaped seagrass. You've been seeing a lot of Thalassia come up um, in, uh, along with the sargassum, because the very rough seas are actually damaging the, the thalassia beds. So this is another this is another issue entirely. We've been having very rough weather, and our reefs, of course, are not as protective as they used to be. So the seagrass beds are being damaged, and and you're seeing sargassum biomass. Now the interesting thing is many collectors, many persons who use um, the sargassum. Once there is pl other plant biomass with it, it's perfectly usable. If, if you're not using it for very meticulous extractions and so on, it's plant biomass. And so 
fantastic. The whole mass can be used. Awesome. I hope that helps our colleague over in the Portland Bioprotected area. Uh, we do have an evaluation instrument. We haven't had many takers for the evaluation instrument, but thus far persons have been indicating to us, yes, they are, they like both presentations and they are interested in other topics relating to mangroves and protected airs. We also have some educators with us. We have fisher folk with us and we have other researchers with us. So this has been our session focusing on sargasm solutions. We heard about the research which Professor Weber is doing. She has been using the sargasm and testing it along with her students. Uh, Caperton Hall, I see him in the chat as well. One of her research students, um, they have been doing research looking at how they can use sargasm to improve mangrove growth. And we heard from Barbados our colleague Joshua Fort, CEO of Red Diamond Compost of the work they have been doing. I'm particularly enthused in this October when we focus on cancer, that research is also taking place with the pharmaceutical industries and they have been looking at what they can, the extracts can be used for breast cancer and prostate cancer. There is of course much more work to be done and we are hearing of the opportunities that are also available here in the Caribbean. And we have partners online, Puerto Rico and Florida are interested in working closer with us. So this has been quite a, a bit of a fruitful morning. We see more connections across the Caribbean as well. We invite you to join us this Friday morning as we will hear from Professor Mona Weber, as she focuses on another aspect to her research here in Jamaica, microplastics. And she will be joined by Donovan Hay from the, Clab from the CCAM Foundation, as they will focus on microplastics. And Mr. Hay will share with us his research on marine species, specifically our shore birds. So that's gonna take place this Friday morning at 10 a.m. We look forward to you joining us. Of course, if you want to hear more from the work that the National Environment and Planning Agency does, and as once it's put out on our YouTube channel, you can be the first to get it. All you have to do is like, click, subscribe right here at NEPA Jamaica. On behalf of the team of the National Environment and Planning Agency, and our guest, Joshua Fort, CEO of Red Diamond Compost Limited in Barbados, and our guest professor, Mona Weber, our researcher here at the University of the West Indies. Thank you for joining us for a session on Sargasm Solutions. See you next Friday. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>